Now this morning I invite you to take your Bibles, please, and turn with me once again to the book of Colossians. We want to wrap up this abbreviated series on discipleship, daring to be authentic disciples this morning. And I invite you to turn to Colossians chapter 3, and we want to pick it up here at verse 12, and we will <clears throat> read through verse uh, 17. Will you please stand in honor of the word of God, and you follow along as I read. The words are up on the screen as well. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts since as members of one body you are called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to the Lord. Now verse 17, let's read that all together. And whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Father in heaven, I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to the truth in this passage as we seek to continue uh, the process that you've begun in each of our lives that we would become more and more like you. Uh, it's a process, Lord, that never ends. It's a process that will never end until one day we see you face to face. And in the meantime, Lord, we want to be the kind of disciples that sit at your feet and learn from you and seek to be all that you've called us to be. We love you so much. Uh, speak to our hearts, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As human beings, God has made every single one of us unique and special. Uh, we come from different backgrounds. We have diverse gifts. We have different personalities and unique passions, and every single one of us matters to God. God is at work in our hearts, uh, and he is forming us and shaping us because we are on this journey toward Christ's likeness. Uh, this morning, I want us to talk about a disciple's passion. Uh, when we think about passion, we think about something that we are so devoted to that it, it basically... Uh, takes over our lives. It's something that, that, that consumes us. It's, it's something that is so important to us that uh, nothing else really matters. And uh, oftentimes, uh, it's pretty obvious what people's passions are. Now, I'm going to mention a couple of names here uh, in the secular world as well as in the religious world. And I'm going to mention a name, and you tell me what their passion is. Okay? Uh, so here we go. Uh, if I mention the name of the Earnhardt family, what is their passion? Racing. Okay. The whole family of racers. They, they, that's, that's what they're all about. If I mention the name Rockefeller, money. Okay. <laughs> if I mention the name Kennedy, politics. Okay, that kind of thing. All right. Now, let's, let's switch gears a little bit. If I mention the name James Dobson, what is his passion? Family, family, okay, Dobson family. If I mention the name R.C. Sproul, what, what, is, what is Sproul's passion? The theology, there you go. He's, he's all about theology. Uh, if I mention the name, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, may, maybe you're not aware of this name, but John Perkins, uh, all of you uh, know what John Perkins, what his passion is. He was an African-American uh, pastor that has toured all around the country. What do you think his passion is? Well, it's basically uh, justice, 
Uh, it is social action and justice. I've I had the privilege of having John Perkins in several of the churches that I pastored, and he's an incredible man of God uh, that loves Jesus Christ supremely. If I mention the name Billy Graham, evangelism, okay. If I mention the name the Apostle Paul, what was the Apostle Paul's passion? The gospel or Christ. Remember Philippians chapter 3, uh, and also in chapter 1, he says that I may know him, that his, he was so passionate about Jesus, I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. And then he goes on to say, for me to live as Christ. Everything that Paul did, it was all about Jesus. And so I, I think it's important for us uh, periodically to kind of examine our lives and ask ourselves the question, what are we really passionate about? What drives us? What consumes us? Uh, so that we can contribute to the uh, formation and the continuation of the kingdom of God. Now, last week, we uh, talked to you a little bit about spiritual priorities, and our priorities are shaped, you will remember, by the perspectives that we have. And we gain a right perspective as we grow closer in our relationship with the Lord Jesus, and as we are obedient to his word. The more we are obedient to his word, then there are priorities that come out of that perspective that shape our lives and shape the things that are really important to us. And last week, we observed that there were three transformative priorities that the Colossians developed uh, because of their perspective of putting Jesus Christ first in their lives. First of all, authentic disciples they aim at things which are above. Notice in chapter 3 and verse 1, he says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds, verse 2, on things above, not on earthly things. And so a growing, authentic disciple is one who does not allow the world to squeeze us into its mold, but rather we seek those things that are from above, for Christ is seated. Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. You realize he's making intercession for us. There's not a thing that enters our life that's lives that catches him off guard. So he is there, he is seated high and lifted up, and we're to be taken up with heavenly things. We aim at things which are above. Uh, we also discover that authentic disciples not only aim at things which are above, but they acknowledge their new position in Christ. We talked about this at great length last week. Verse 3, for you died. In other words, when we accepted Jesus Christ, the old life we nailed to the cross. Uh, we're no longer going to let the old life have control over us. And verse 3 continues by saying, your life is now hidden with Christ in God. In other words, we are consumed with the life of Christ. The old life... There's always going to be battle. There's always going to be a tug of war b between the old life and this brand new life that Christ has given us. But we have the power through the resurrection of Christ to overcome uh, the temptations to go back to the old way of living. And one of the marks of a disciple of Jesus Christ is that daily, Paul said, he said, I die daily. He nails that old nature to the cross every single day. And as we nail that old nature to the cross, then we begin to have priorities that speak of that relationship. And then lastly, we discovered that authentic disciples anticipate their new destiny in verse 4. Notice, when Christ, who is your life. In other words, as believers in Jesus Christ, Christ consumes us. He becomes our life. And when he becomes our life, we understand that we have a destiny that's being prepared for us in heaven, that even now is being prepared for all those that love him. And we look forward to that eternal destiny. We don't allow the things of this life to jade us or to cause us to no longer focus on this incredible destiny that we have because of Jesus Christ. Now, it's interesting that out of our priorities comes our passion. 
And it's interesting now as Paul begins to speak about the passion of a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ, he uses several imperatives. Uh, First of all, he says this authentic disciple develop a passion for Christ's character. Notice verse 12, see the word therefore? Whenever you see that word therefore, you need to ask your question, what is it there for? Okay? It's based on the fact that we no longer are feeding the old nature, but we are feeding this new nature. He says, therefore, as Christ's chosen people. Aren't you glad you've been chosen by God today? <laughs> Aren't you thankful? When was the last time you just said to, to God, thank you for choosing me? You, you've, you've wiped the slate clean. You've given me the righteousness of Christ. I'm no longer in bondage to sin. You've transformed me. I'm so thankful I belong to you. This, this, uh, oh, I, I can start preaching here. Uh, anyway, God's chosen people, notice, holy and dearly loved, and then here's the imperative, continue on clothing yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness. We'll get into that in just a minute. But I want you to focus on that phrase, clothe yourselves it's a strong imperative it literally means to adorn yourself or to get outfitted with a new wardrobe now i don't know about many of you but i'm sure most of you uh, periodically you like to get a change in your your wardrobe don't you Uh, you've been wearing stuff for a long long time and maybe it's beginning to wear out a little bit and so what do you do you go to the store you buy yourself a new dress or some casual, you know, trousers and shirts, and then you put on those, those new clothes, that new wardrobe, and how do you feel? You feel a little bit better, don't you? Huh, huh? Okay. Well, that's what the Apostle Paul's talking about in this passage. He's talking about a wardrobe change. Uh, once we were outfitted with things that belonged to this world, that he talks about in those previous verses, but now he says, as transformed individuals, you have a brand new set of threads to try on. And I want you to adorn yourself. I want you to clothe yourselves with these uh, qualities, these, these transformative graces that God wants us to put on as new believers in Christ. I remember as a kid singing a little song. I'm not going to sing it for you. I'd scare all of you. But uh, the song goes like this. Oh, the best thing in my life I ever did do. Well, the best thing in my life I ever did do was get rid of the old stuff, take off the old robe, and put on the new. Oh, the old robe was dirty, all tattered and torn, but the new robe was spotless, had never been worn. Oh, the best thing in my life I ever did do was take off the old robe and put on the new. That's exactly what he's speaking about here in this particular passage. He says, now I want you to put on a new set of threads, get rid of the old. That's all been covered with the blood of Christ. And now I want you to become more and more like Jesus. I want you to go after the character of Christ And then he defines just exactly what that character of Christ is. He says, first of all, we adorn ourselves with compassion. Now, if you study the life of Christ, you'll discover that compassion was something that characterized him throughout his earthly ministry. The Bible said when he saw the multitudes kind of wandering without any kind of direction, without any kind of shepherding, He was moved with compassion over and over again. When you see Jesus in relationship to others, he is filled with compassion. Compassion is a unselfish heart. When we are compassionate people, the focus is no longer on us. The focus is on others. Jesus had feelings for others. He was concerned about them. He had a tenderness about him. And when others were hurting, he felt those very same hurts. And so he's calling us to develop this quality of compassion because of this 
wardrobe change that we're involved in. Secondly, he says we're to put on kindness. Now, kindness, again, is the exact opposite of harshness. When God changes us, he changes us from the inside out. I'm reminded of Tim LaHaye. Many of you may recognize that name. <clears throat> Back in the 80s, uh, he would do uh, seminars, and uh, we would go to a number of those. And I'll never forget, in one of the seminars he was doing, he, he described his life before he became a Christian. And he had been a, a kind of a hardened Marine, and he was, he was, he was angry, he was harsh. He, he talked about how, how his life had, had, before he came to know Christ. And now, the only time I saw Tim LaHaye was after his conversion, after he knew Christ. And as he was describing this old life, I could hardly identify with him because he just oozed Jesus. There was something about him that was so, so it would draw people to him because of the genuineness of his character. And that told me that he had made a wardrobe change, kindness instead of harshness, instead of anger, uh, the things that controlled him before he had a relationship to Christ no longer reigned supreme. Number three, we put on humility. Uh, people that are growing in their relationship with Christ uh, do not have an exalted opinion of themselves. They don't go around boasting on what they've accomplished. Uh, they don't feel any kind of a sense of superiority. Uh, rather, they want to put on the mind of Christ. And you'll remember the mind of Christ is the mind of humility. In fact, Paul speaks about this in Philippians. He says, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Even though he came from God the Father, he left all the glories of heaven. He left being part of the Godhead to put on human flesh for us, and he did it because of Humility, he, he did not consider his heavenly realm something he wanted to hang on to at all costs. He laid it aside because he loved us. And authentic disciples develop that same kind of a philosophy where uh, our life is not about us. It's always about others. We develop the philosophy of Gail Sayers, that great running back of the Chicago Bears, he t entitled his autobiography, God First, Others Second, and I Am Third. You see, that is the mind that we are to cultivate as we put on these new set of clothes. He also says in this verse that we outfit ourselves with gentleness, and again, gentleness is not weakness. Gentleness is strength under control. It's an inner strength that God gives us in difficult situations where we can be gentle in the face of criticism. We can be gentle in the face of opposition. We don't throw our weight around. Remember, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 5, blessed are the gentle, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. He goes on to say that another part of our new wardrobe, uh, can't even say it, wardrobe, is patience. And patience is really a slowness in avenging wrongs that have been committed to us. It, you see, the, the way of the world is an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. We live in a world which practices revenge. If we've been hurt, we're going to get back at that person. If somebody has hurt us, we're going we're gonna to settle the score. But that's not the way we as Christ followers respond. Uh, we don't seek revenge. We pray for our enemies. We pray for those who despise us and who say negative things about us because, again, our life has been hidden with Christ and God. Authentic discipleship has to do with patience and self-control and self-restraint, not because it comes easy. None of these pieces of the wardrobe are easily fit to our characters. Many of us struggle with this. 
It's like trying to get into a, a new piece of clothing and it doesn't fit quite right. And, and sometimes it's too tight or it's too loose. And, and it's the same way with cultivating these particular virtues. It, it, it's difficult. And, and sometimes we wrestle with that. But, but we must always realize that this is a journey toward Christ's likeness that will never end until we see Jesus. And then he also talks about uh, outfitting ourselves with a forbearing and a forgiving spirit. In other words, we can never allow disagreements to turn into dislike or to pull us away from one another. You see, there is a spiritual bond that exists in the body of Christ. And that spiritual bond is something that is so holy and so precious. It should never cause us to to pull away. Oh, we may have differences of opinion. That's okay. But that unity, that, that unity that... Christ provided for us at the cross. That spiritual bond that unites us together, we should guard with our very lives and do everything we can to preserve this unity that Jesus laid down his life to purchase when he died on the cross for us. And so when he talks about this forbearing and a forgiving spirit, it's something that is not something that comes naturally. Uh, but it comes as a result of forgetting about ourselves and allowing the forgiveness and the unity that is part of what Christ purchased for us at Calvary to be evidenced in our lives. And then he says the one grace that pulls all of it together. He's been talking about these various, he says the one grace that pulls it all together is love. And love here is pictured as an outer garment which binds all the other virtues together. Love is a bond that unites. And there is something about a congregation that is deeply in love with Jesus and is deeply in love with one another that becomes a magnet that draws unchurched people to Christ. You you see, that's what... God wants to do in our lives. He wants us to be outfitted with all these virtues and then be bound up with love so when the world looks at us, they don't look at our past, the past way we used to live. They see this new wardrobe that we have outfitted ourselves with, this character of Christ that is a never-ending pursuit for those of us who know and love Jesus. So we need to develop a passion for his character. Number two, Paul says we need to develop a passion to discern Christ's rule. Notice verse 15. He says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts since as members of one body you were called to peace. Now it's very interesting that This peace here, the peace of Christ, you could translate that phrase, the peace belonging to Christ. Uh, This peace of Christ is something that only our Savior can impart. It's that deep tranquility of a subtleness that no matter what comes against us, there's nothing between us and the Lord, and we're at peace with ourselves, we're at peace with others, we're at peace with those around us. John 14, 27, he puts it this way. Jesus explains, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Now, in the secular world at this time, this word for peace uh, was often used as a greeting. As we would say, hi, how are you? Many times in the East, they would say, peace be with you. It was a greeting. But in this particular context, the peace that Jesus is talking about is much more than a greeting. It is an inner settledness that we belong to Jesus and, and his peace, his, this tranquility, this, this sense that everything's going to be okay. This is a wonderful sense that God gives to us 
because we're walking in obedience to him. Now, you see, when the world speaks about peace, it speaks of a peace that's conditioned on circumstances. Uh, everybody wants to have peace, especially when there's chaos, when there is war. But you see, the peace of Jesus is not dependent upon circumstances. It depends totally on our relationship to Christ himself. Now, notice what he says here. And here's where the command is. Let the peace of Christ rule. That word rule basically means to uh, decide things, to control things. Uh, To rule means to be in charge. In the athletic world, you could take that word to mean uh, let the peace of Christ be the umpire uh, in your hearts. Now, remember, an umpire is the person who is there to uh, decide whether a player is out or whether the player is safe, uh, whether it's a ball or a strike. Uh, And that if you don't have an umpire, uh, basically you have mass chaos. Remember remember those days when you were playing Sandlot uh, uh, baseball and everybody would argue every play, oh, that's not an out, that wasn't a strike. I, I mean, it, it. you spend more time arguing than you do playing the game. And so what, what Paul is saying here, he says, I want you as my fully devoted followers to let this peace, this inner tranquility of soul be the umpire in your lives. Uh, when you're torn between doing something that you know would clash with your Christian convictions and the peace of Christ, you choose the peace of Christ. When we're tempted to allow irritation and anger to get the best of us, we let the peace of Christ call the shots. When our business associates ask us to compromise our convictions by being dishonest or unethical, that, that umpire, the peace of Christ, enables us to remain strong in our faith and resist temptation. When our friends want us to do what we know is wrong, the peace of Christ whispers in our ear, what would Jesus do? When we're tempted to go the wrong way, it's that peace of Christ, it's that umpire that helps us to choose not the way of least resistance, but the way of Christ. So our relationship with Jesus produces this inner peace that umpires all of our actions. And as believers in Christ, we don't let our impulses control us. We let the peace of Christ control us in every dimension. And then lastly, I want you to notice, Paul encourages us to develop a passion to dwell in Christ's word. Look at verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell. Put a circle around that word. Dwell. Dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. Now, when we start thinking about the word of Christ, it refers to the very words that Christ speaks. And his words are recorded in this book we call the Bible. And Paul says authentic disciples allow the word of Christ, this this word that has been God breathed out to us, we are to allow this book, to dwell in us richly, and you see, I'm going to say, we need to be under the authority of the book. Okay? Uh, If we bring the book down here, and we let our ideas supersede our devotion to Jesus, then we're in big trouble. But he says, I want you to develop a passion for the word of God. I want that word to dwell in you richly. 
or abundantly. John MacArthur in his book, Living the Risen Life, puts it this way. This means that we are to be so jammed full of spiritual truth that if we cut anywhere, we bleed Bible verses. Let the word of God fill you up. In other words, we need to fill up our minds every day with the scriptures. I don't know any other way to be successful in the Christian life in today's, <coughs> in, in today's very post-Christian era to ever make it without being filled to the full with the word of God. This, this book must become our consuming passion. This book and its precepts, the Bible says that this book is life. You cannot experience life in Christ and neglect this book. This is our life. And so he says, I want the word of God to dwell in you richly. I want you to saturate your minds and your hearts. The gospel, the word of God must become a passion for us. Not just something we turn to when we have an issue or we have a problem, but something that we are passionately in love with. And when we do, when it becomes something that we're passionate about, we're going to be equipped, notice, to help others. Look at this. He says, let it dwell richly in you as you, or put a circle around it, as you, what, teach and admonish one another. In other words, when we are full of the word of God and we see a brother or sister beginning to kind of slip away, we reach out to them. We don't ignore them. We're so concerned for them, we we will sacrifice our time and our energy and our effort to reach out to someone that's beginning to stray. Why? Because we're full of the word of God. And when we're full of the word of God and we see someone else slipping up or stepping on a banana peel, we do everything in our power to bring them back into relationship, back into fellowship with Jesus. That's what it's all about. Notice, as you admonish, that is, as you encourage, as you teach with all wisdom, and then notice, as you sing psalms, and hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. In other words, <laughs> what, what he's looking for are joyful people. <laughs> joyful. That's what he's after. And, and let me tell you, when we are full of the word of God, joy will overflow. It, it, I, I'm, try, I'm trying to figure out words to express this. It's something that wells up within you and you cannot contain it. It just comes out. I mean, people know that you've been in touch with Jesus. There is a joy that that just radiates from your heart. Why? (laughs) You've been dwelling in the word of God. There are no shortcuts to joy. The only way this can be possible is when we just fill our minds and our hearts on a daily basis with the truth of the word of God. And by dwelling in Christ and his word, we minister to those in need. Just think how tragic it would be that there's someone else in the body that has need. And because we haven't been dwelling in the word of God, we're not sensitive to that. You see, see, I believe that the body needs to minister to the body. What makes healthy churches is when the family of God is full of the word of God and every person matters and every person is significant. And we care enough about each other that we won't let anyone fall off the deep end. We will go after them. And that's why dwelling in the word of God is so significant because it keeps us sharp spiritually. I think if we're honest with ourselves, this is, this is an area that many of us struggle with. 
uh, we know we need to allow the word of God to dwell richly in us. But all too often, we just render lip service to the word of God. Only time any of us ever really dig into the scripture and really start doing some serious Bible study is when things are not going so well. And I believe what Paul is saying here, I want you to have a passion. I want you to have a passion just like the Earnhardts have for racing or that the Rockefellers had for, for money. I want you to be passionate about the Word of God. I want the Word of God to grip you, transform you so that you can minister the grace of God, God to others And notice he concludes here by saying, and I love this, with gratitude in your hearts to God. Isn't that fabulous? The more we do this, we will be so full of gratitude that God is using us for his purposes, for his glory. And then he wraps this all up in verse 17 and says, And whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, let's say it together. Do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. These are the passions that God wants us to go after. We must have a passion to develop Christ's character to discern his rule and to dwell in his word. The story is told of three boys who were playing in the snow one day and a man came along and said, would you like to race across the snow? And if you will race across the snow, I'm going to give you the winner, I'll give uh, the winner a prize. And so the three boys agreed to, to run through the snow The boys lined up, and he said, go, and they took off. Uh, The race started. The first boy kept looking at his feet to make sure he was running in a straight line. Remember, that was the challenge. You have to run in a straight line. So he was looking at his feet to run in a straight line. The second boy, he was looking at his companion to see if he was in a straight line. But the third boy just ran with his eyes steady on the man who challenged them, and he ran straight as an arrow. My friends, we need to be running as straight as an arrow after King Jesus. And when we are consumed with him, when his priorities become our priorities, when his perspective becomes our perspective, when his passion becomes our passion, Let me tell you, the world will sit up and take notice that we have been with Jesus. Bow our heads in prayer. Oh, to be like thee, Lord, that is our prayer today. We want to be more than conquerors through you. We want to be filled up with the word of God so that we bleed Bible verses. We want the character of Christ to be formed in us. We want to allow that peace that passes all understanding to be the umpire in our hearts on this journey that will never end until one day we see you face to face. And so, Lord, as we leave here today, I pray that we would do so in the strong name of Jesus, that you will have grabbed a hold of us and helped us to outfit ourselves with a new wardrobe and to let your peace call the shots in our lives and above all that your word would become so precious to us that it would dwell richly in us so that we can touch others with the life of Christ. Thank you that through Christ we are more than conquerors. We love you. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.